Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this, another episode of 10 years ago. Now tonight we're going to be looking at WCW Sin from January 2001. Now do you remember a couple of weeks ago when I did my WWF Royal Rumble 2001 review? I mentioned that that show pulled a massive, quite colossal, 1.35 buy rate, which it did. Um, do you remember that? Um, have, have a guess, <laughs> have a, a rough guess as to what this one pulled. Compared to the Royal Rumble, because let me tell you something. Unless you, unless you've got, unless you click the description here and you've got the figure in front of you, you're way off. I guarantee it. This show did a truly monumental 0.17 buy rate, meaning that well, no one watched it. To be fair, um, yeah. So shall we get on with this one? This, of course, replaced the sold out pay-per-view that had emanated for what the last four years 97 98 99 2000 the january show was all always sold out this time it's not it's called sin so in the opening contest charbo guerrero defeated shane helms in a very good match to retain the cruiserweight championship so let's start off shall we so some nice chain wrestling at the start including shane locking on an arm bar twice he continues to work the arm and hits and head scissors and a face buster he gets two off a sunset flip but then goes spine busted charbo goes low and then the ref actually tells him off now i say that because if you've been watching either the 1999 Suck series or the 10 years ago series, you'll be well aware that in WCW, low blows and, let's be honest, pretty much anything that could have caused a disqualification go completely unpunished. They get, they get ignored. They're completely ignored. So when the referee actually told Charvo off for doing a low blow, I was just like, wow, best write that down. Because it just really went, my God. Dropkick gets two for Charvo, who puts on a oh, goddamn chin lock. Match him in... Match has been you know, unusually grounded so far for a cruiserweight match. Not that I'm complaining at all, but well, I'm complaining about a chain, chain lock, obviously, because there's just no need for those whatsoever. But yeah, you expect a cruiserweight match to be flippy floppy, spotty spotty, but this was all pretty much groundwork so far. You know, not that I'm complaining at all. Shane comes back with a atomic drop and a neck breaker, which leads to a double KO, which the crowd are really into you know a double ko the referee gets a 10 count going the crowd are chanting along they're loving the double ko interesting that isn't it because normally the crowd just don't care these days um slugfest leads to a perfect straight jacket suplex for i forget which gets two for shame super kick gets two for shame Chavo dumps Shane, hits a plancher, and Shane, Shane block inside, sorry, Shane blocks a suplex, dumps Chavo, and hits a plancher of his own, which is mm, just a tiny little bit nicer than Chavo, the one that Chavo did, oh yes. <laughs> and um, Sunset Flip gets two, as does a Samoan drop, as does a Nightmare on Helm Street. He tries a second one, but Charvo counters and tries to go for the Tornado DT. That's counted as Train tries the Nightmare again, but that's counted into a Brain Buster for the win. Ladies and gentlemen, that to me is a three and a half star opener. If you wanted to go for the whole four stars, wouldn't bother me at all. Really, really good match. Heated opener. Next, Reno defeated Big Vio in a surprisingly okay match. When these two were making their way to the ring, I'm sat there thinking to myself, this is going to be bollocks. You know, this is not going to be fun at all. So, Reno starts with a lariat and a nice power slam for two. After a brawl on the outside, Vito hits a suplex for two. Crap looking into gear and a back suplex, followed by a, um, a blind charge misses. Again, they brawl on the outside before Reno takes control with a lariat, but Vito gets two off a sunset flip, then hits a mafia kick and a clothesline. A double underhook suplex and an elbow off the top get two for Vito. The roll of the dice is counted into a suplex for two by Vito. T-bone suplex by Reno. Salt Fest leads to a roll of the dice for the win for Reno. Now, like I say, I was expecting this one to be absolutely fucking terrible. Why don't I ever open the window before I start my reviews? Really should, really should, shouldn't I? I was it too hot because I'm so animated and talking. Yes, should just open the window. Oh, okay, we're getting disturbed. Anyway, yeah, one and a half star match is perfectly adequate, if I'm honest. You know, I mean, maybe, yeah, you want to knock off a few points because there's a couple of botches, but you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, you know, must, must, have, must have really enjoyed that opener a lot because, yeah, I could say star and a half. Next match of the night. Um, as Young Dragons defeated Evan Bourne and Jamie Noble in a great match. This is a three and three quarters match. Like I say, match of the night. Kaz starts off with an Ocean Cyclone Suplex that is so nice. Yeah, I had to rewind it back and, and watch it again. Rare is the day that I do that with spots. But that was just that was just such a oh, had to do that. 
Um, Evan and Jamie uh, Bale. So the um, bur, 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 bur. I'm sorry, I don't know what that means. Oh, I'm sorry. Can't read my own writing sometimes. Evan and Jamie bail to the outside, so the dragons hit double assay moon salts to the outside. Epic! Jamie and Yang go at it until Jamie hits a Rana, take over the ropes, which is beautiful. He hits a Rana, literally takes him over the top of the ropes. Beautiful, really, really nice move. Cass drops who holds Evan onto a turnbuckle bit. Uh, but he is able to shrug it off and hits a nice double slam with Jamie. Power slam gets two for Evan, as does a drop toe odd slash. Drop kick combo, as does a back suplex. German by Noble and a lovely press slam into a spine buster by Evan. That was really, really good. Um, he does another power slam, then mm, predictable style. Never liked Evan Courageous, to be honest, but he botches a moonsault. Noble tags in and prevents the hot tag to Yang in Seguri to Noble by Kaz, who finally hot tags Yang in. He cleans house, hits a dragon through, then tries a figure four. And I am so into this match, you wouldn't fucking believe it. German by Noble gets two as Evan hits a plancher to the outside. Top rope power slam by Yang gets two. Um, as Evan breaks the cover, Evan with a net break, and then he hits a 450 splash, which as far as I'm aware, he'd never done before, which is like, yay, cool. Uh, that gets two. Kaz with a beautiful slingshot DDT on Evan. Amazing tombstone pile driver by Noble gets two. I say it's amazing because he jumps in the air before he does it. It's so nice. Yang with a uh, rolling slam and a corkscrew moonsault misses. Inside cradle by Yang gets the win. This was good. This was crisp. This was smooth. It would have been a four star match for definite, but there's a couple of little botches in there that you know, meant I had to knock a book on you. Know, that little point up, but literally tiny little bit. And also, I tell you this much this would have been a four and a quarter star match if there'd been mm, just a tiny little bit of psychology in there because there was none there was literally zero but of course you know in cruiserweight matches where it's spot 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 yeah you didn't really expect it so you know all good so that's three good matches no not three two good matches one average match so far can wcw maintain this for the whole show Maybe, maybe they can. There's the cat defeated Mike Sanders in a match to become the commissioner. Also have to mention that Miss Jones was on the line. This one, two stipulations in one match. When it only needs to have the one, surely. Anyway, Sanders cat, this is going to be shit, isn't it? We know that. Sanders chokes cat to start, but cat comes back with a shoulder block. Uh, Sanders controls with some shit looking offense, but Cat comes back with some kicks and a 10 punch in the corner. Low blow by Sanders, who hits a kick for two. Cat dances and drops an elbow. Sanders goes to use a chair, but Miss Jones stops him. Out comes the natural bronze thrillers who attack the cat, but then Chronic come out and they stop them attacking the cat, which is all good for him. Big kick finishes for Cat for a big pop. Didn't do this one for me at all. But it has to be said that I really don't like Mike Sanders. Mike Sanders, it's not just because he's, you know, because he's a big bad heel and he's meant to be getting heat. I just don't like the guy at all. Um, yeah, there was a little backstory I should probably mention for this one, which was that um, basically Mike Sanders had paid off Chronic to attack the cat in the middle of the match. But then the cat had gone to Chronic and given them even more money. That's, that, that's what you're meant to gather by that, I guess, I think. I'm going to have to, yeah, like I say, purely guesswork on that one. Next. Yeah, I gave that one half a star because I'm nice. <laughs> Backstage, Ric Flair meets, uh, makes Goldberg, he makes Goldberg's match a dis no disqualification match and then he introduces some old high school buddies to him, which is lovely. But, you know, and you sat there like, where's the context of this one? Bear in mind because it's going to be very important later on. Just remember that. High school buddy. Next, Team Canada, which is Lance Storm, Mike Orson, who I'm sure is American, but, you know, I may be wrong, if I'm wrong, just please say. And Elix Skipper defeated the Filthy Animals, which is Kidman, Conan, and Rey Mysterio in a good penalty box match. Now, I've only ever heard of penalty box matches in, um, oh God, what's it called? In the world-class territory back in the 80s. Um, if you've never heard of a penalty box, which I hadn't heard, <laughs> you know, I didn't know the rules. I'd heard of a penalty box match, but I didn't know the rules. Basically, it's simple as this. If you do something that's illegal, the referee sends you to the penalty box and he specifies how long you will spend in the penalty box. Now, I guess the referee for this one is Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Hooray. So, shall we get on with it? Um, boom, boom, boom. Ray Mysterio and Lance Storm start off with Ray doing a nice springboard. Rana Storm responds by crotching Ray on the top rope. Either Skipper gets in without tagging his force into the box by Hacksaw Jim Duggan, as does Awesome. This is very, very strange. 
someone like me just watching this going, what odd booking? I'll clarify that in a second. Um, Storm gets owned, as you can probably imagine, by the three baby faces, um, including power, including Conan and power bombing um, Ray onto him. He picks him up and Ray, you know, picks Ray up, power bombs him on top of Storm, which is nice. And Ray getting a um, a splash for two. Some nice back and forth between Kidman and Skipper leads to a back suplex by Kidman. Orson pulls Kidman's hair and gets sent to the box again, as does Storm. Now this is the point that I'm trying. I'm, I'm thinking because I'm watching this going. This doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense because I really need to start writing these down into what I've done with them. But wrestling 101 decrees that in a match like this, the heels cheat, yeah, and they make it look like the faces are the ones that are in the wrong. Therefore, the referees send the, the faces to the penalty box. Yes, that way it's a three on one or a three on two beatdown. Basically, the faces have one less guy, so they get owned. It, it's called building sympathetic heat for the baby faces. But in this case, the booking's so messed up that this is twice now that two members of the heel team have been sent to the penalty box. And the thing is, as well, is they keep doing stupid stuff like like this. Um, is that um. Where is it? Shit, I can't remember where it was now. Oh, some Kidman puts a, I'm sure Kidman puts a, 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 a chin lock on. And you're just like, I'm like, if you've got the advantage, why would you put a submission move on? You just take it in turns and battering them. Surely! Nice DC by Kidman on uh, Skipper. Conan locks on a Mr. Salty, which will only make sense if you've seen the Jericho DVD. If you've seen the Chris Jericho DVD, the Breaking the Walls Down one, a Mr. Salty will make perfect sense to you, I guarantee it. Ray with a springboard leg drop on Skipper. Great little spot as Skipper. Oh, this is so nice, right? Conan goes to clothesline Skipper, and Skipper does the, um, the you know, the Matrix thing that Trish Stratus used to do, you know, where she leans back, yeah? But, you know, it's really cocky and everything. He then sort of sits up, and Conan catches him in reverse DDT is him. Fucking love uh, that gets two. Awesome tags in and hits a backbreaker for two on Conan. Major Guns and Tigress argue on the outside as Raymond Sura and Kidman go to the box for double teaming. Catfight sends the wenches to the box. So it's Skipper with a botched leg drop. And there we go. He then puts, puts the chin lock on. See what I was saying? He puts the chin lock on. So it's the three heels on one face and he puts a chin lock on. And that to me is the third baffling moment of this match. You're, just like, you're watching this as a fan game, and this doesn't make sense. This is the type of thing that TNA would do. Oh, yes. I'm sure of it. The thing is, what's really annoying is the match is pretty damn good, to be honest. And you know, Conan hits an X-Factor and tags in Kidman. He owns Storm, including a bomb for two. Big Brawl on the outside puts four men in the box, leaving Storm and Rey Mysterio. Bronco busted by Rey and Tigress, who goes... In, and, you know, sorry. Bronco busted by Rey Mysterio, who then, and then Tigress... Sent then Tigress does one. Tigress, that's like digress. Tigress does one as well, so she's sent to the box. Um buh, 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 buh. It would be it would be wrong of me to go on any further, to be honest, because there's there's, there's a th thing I need to bring up because I put it in capitals on my notes, and that is that someone in the crowd, in the front row, has got a whistle. Now whistles do my head in. They really get on my nerves. Bill Alfonso used to drive me up the wall when in ECW with his fucking whistle. And this, one of the things, I'm not saying this match is bad in any way, it's a two and a half star match, but I'll tell you something. One of the things that's really distracting from this match is the fact that this fucking idiot has got a whistle. It's like, shut up! Anyway, Leg Drop gets two for Ray, uh, Kid Crusher gets two for Kidman. Huge awesome bomb on Ray and a Maple Leaf on Kidman gets the win! In ring, this was a really good match if you could take off the obvious lack of psychology completely. But it was just, the booking was some of the weirdest I've ever seen. Because it, only one time during the match the heels had the advantage, the rest of the time the faces had the advantage. And it shouldn't work like that surely. But, you know, I don't make the decision. Yeah, two and a half stars. Next. Meng defeated Crowbar and Terry Funk in a match to win the Hardcore title. Now, I should probably have done this pay-per-view in the, in the other way around to the Royal Rumble, shouldn't I? Because, of course, we saw Meng become hardcore, you know, become hack, wasn't it? No. What's his name? Oh, shit. I've forgotten. Haku, hardcore hack is fucking Sandman. Haku returned to the Royal Rumble in 2001, didn't he? But of course, this was on like it's on like the first weekend of um, of January. Like I said, I've done these the wrong way round, really, haven't I? But anyway, so yeah. <laughs> 
basically when when um, when Haku turned up in the Royal Rumble, he was still recognised as the hardcore champion, the belt that he'd won in this match. So it's gone with this over. So Terry Funk is on his way to the ring, he spots Daphne in the crowd and he drags her out. Um, crowbar attacks him from behind and with a chair and they go backstage and head into a female toilet. More men joins them in the ring, in, in, in the toilet. They brawl around the toilet and Daphne screams and there's brawling and I don't really care if I'm honest. It's one of those, mm, get on with it. Men gets buried under five tables. There's basically a stack of five tables. So Crowbar and Funk basically stack them on top of t of top of men. That gets rid of men for a couple of minutes. They go. They start brawling to the ring and um, Crowbar puts Funk on a table, climbs up onto the bleachers and does a splash onto him. Well, I would say he does a splash onto him. We don't get to see it. Do you know what we see on screen instead? We see a picture of the ring, yeah, and a guy's arm. We see that, basically, and the ring. I think something happened in the ring, so you got one of the ring crews repairing the ring. So we don't get to see what the move is, so I'm sorry, I can't actually tell you what it was. Yay! Aren't we lucky? God damn! <laughs> Men breaks the pin on a super kick. Simply Craig Crowbar, but Funk hits him with um, with a snow shovel. He sets up a guardrail and puts Crowbar on. He literally puts him on you, scoops slams him onto it. The, the guardrail conveniently breaks in two, and you're just like, oh, that looks shit. If a, if a guardrail bends a little bit because of the impact, all good. If it breaks, that just looks fake. You know? Oh well. Uh, in the ring, Crowbar uses a chair on Funk's knee and puts a figure four on. Men comes off the top with a splash to break it. He then hits a power driver on Crowbar and a splash on Funk for two. Funk and Men use chain use chairs sorry, on uh, Funk and Men use chairs. And then Men then oh, God damn it, that doesn't make any sense. Funk and Men use chairs on Men. Then Funk D T. So it must be Funk here. Yeah, it must be. Funk and Crowbar use chairs on Meng, then Funk DDT's Meng. Crowbar decks Funk with a chair, then eats another super kick, and then get this one, the Tongan Death Grip of Doom! Ah! Gets the win, bizarrely, for Meng. This was surprisingly entertaining after they left the bathroom. So I give it one and a half stars. It was better than it probably should have been. You know, I don't like hardcore brawling, but you know, this was alright. Next, Sean... O'Hare and Chuck Palumbo defeated the Insiders, which of course is Kevin Nash and DP, if you've never seen the Insiders, to win the tag team titles. And another star and a half match. You know? So Bets being taken incidentally from you've got you've got ten seconds if you you've got while well, I have a mouthful of pop to guess how many bumps place your bets now. How many bumps will Kevin Nash take in this match? Go. Mmm, strawberry lemonade. I'm going to go for three. Three is what I'm going to go for. So, Sanders comes out with the rest of the um, natural born throws and says that he will sub O'Hare and Plumbo if needed. He must still think he's the commissioner. So, Rip Flair comes out and says, no, no, you won't. If any of, if any of the natural born throws interfere, you'll be suspended. So, that's all good, isn't it? Flair's the um, CEO of WCW, by the way. Now, the cat's the commissioner. Flair's the CEO, so yeah, both of them can come out and make decisions, how's that sound? Very confusing to me. <laughs> anyway, DP and Palumbo start, DP with a Lariat and a Sambo suplex Nash and O'Hare, then go out with Nish, with Nish? Who's Nish? With Nash hitting a scoop, oh uh, sorry, he doesn't hit a scoop slam at all. He, he does hit a scoop slam and a big boot, but then a super click by O'Hare puts Nash down, one bump. If you had one on your cards, there is one. Tag to Plumbo, who gets uh, heads right until Nash comes back with a snake eye and alert. Page in with a diamond clothesline for two, but then he plays the face in peril, including a slingshot suplex. He finally, after what feels like an age, manages to reverse a tombstone pile driver into one of its own. Hot tag to Nash. Sidewalk slams for everyone, followed by a big boot and for everyone. So then the natural born throws come out. They have Luke's Lex Luger and Buff Bagwell with them. Uh, Nash jackknifes Plumber and Luger sort of lures DDP into the crowd while Buff Bagwell hits Nash with a wrench. Two bumps. Uh, Sean Tom bump and it's all over. Nash did the job. So yeah, it's a sentence you don't say very often in life, is it? You know, and yes, he did two whole bumps in this one. One and a half stars. It wasn't great. It wasn't special. It wasn't bad. How's that sound? Next, we go on to the top three headline matches. I've got to say, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, this show has been, yeah, started well, and then it sort of averaged out, and then it's about to nosedive. 
But one thing that I'm sure you've noticed so far is that there haven't been any duds yet. Will there be any duds? Shane Douglas defeated General Reaction in a crap first blood slash chain slash ladder match. Yes, that's three stipulations. Well, basically it was this, yeah? It's the first blood match, but there's a chain hanging above the ring. So technically it's a ladder match, but it's not a ladder match because if you, if you get the chain, you don't win. But it's not like it's a chain on a pole match, so it has to be a ladder match. So it's a chain, ladder, first blood match. The only way you can win is first blood match. Fucking hell, that's a lot of steps, isn't it? Fuck. Um, referee finds a chain on Douglas straight away. Slugfest, then reaction works an armbar, and he works it for a long time. Works a lot of nice little moves with the arm, which I like. Reaction, uh, yeah, sorry, Douglas hits a few punches and then goes low. Flying clothes, which the referee doesn't give a shit about. I should probably tell him. <laughs> we got one. Hey, we got one. We should be happy about that, shouldn't we? Um, flying close on by Rection. He goes up top and gets crotched. Douglas works the knee and then he puts a figure four on. Now, yeah, the arm bar and the figure four, I have to say, while they're both nice moving, you know, nice little psychology, working the arm, putting the arm bar on, working the knee, putting a figure four on. In the first blood match, that seems completely pointless to me. I'm sorry, maybe it's just me, but yeah, like I say, it just seems utterly, utterly waste of time. Anyway, <laughs> Um, they brawl on the outside into the crowd. Douglas puts on the weirdest looking figure four on the ring post I've ever seen. Puts the legs in the figure four position, yeah? And then he puts his head onto the foot. And you're like, what are you doing, you weird person? Rection comes back with a press slam. He gets a ladder, goes up the top of the ladder, gets the chain. But the referee gets bumped. Shane finds yet another chain in his boots. Uses it to bust Rection open to win the match. Match was absolutely terrible. Yeah, I've given it quarter of a star. It avoids the dud because of the psychology in it. But I'm sure if you wanted to, yeah, you could take that quarter of a star away. Because the psychology is completely redundant and irrelevant in this match. Yay! Everyone's a winner. No, you're not. Then, two more to go. Don't worry, they're both wank. <laughs> Lex Luger and Buff Bagwell defeat Goldberg and Dwayne Bruce in a absolutely shy match. This was my, this is the match that I mentioned on my Starcade review, yeah? Where I said, and now you're going to get Lex Luger and Buff Bagwell versus Goldberg and, and, uh, and the Sarge. Hopefully on Nitro. And I was like, you remember on my stock I looked in the camera and then, oh, unless it happens at Sin, it's like, oh no! Because it does! This is where it happens. Anyway, Goldberg and Luger start off with Goldberg hitting a shoulder block and a nice underhook suplex. Buff in, he suplexes Goldberg, who no sells it and power slams him. Tag to Sarge, he hits a belly to belly suplex and an elbow for two. He then plays Jobber in peril for fucking ages, including taking a DT. Uh, by Buffer 2. Uh, Sarge then counts as a buff suplex and hot tag to Goldberg. He hits a fall away pump handle slam, which is fucking gorgeous. That, ladies and gentlemen, is if you know, at the end of the match, the racing that the rest of the match gets is because of that one move. Excuse me. On the outside, um, the fans who right, remember what I said before, the fans, the old school friends from Ric Flair's, yeah, they're sat in ringside. They all start brawling on the outside, yeah, and the fan. Basically sprays something into Goldberg's face. Now, this is an interesting one because security pounced on him like he's a fan who's jumped over the rail, something like that, yeah? But then Scott Hudson ruins the, the, the Mirage by saying, was that plan C? Basically, uh, Lex Luger and Buff Bagwell earlier on in the show had said, we've got plan A and we've also got plan B. And if they don't work, we've got plan C. Scott Hudson ruins it by saying, that was plan C. Because at that moment, you're like, that was fucking real. Some guys just blasted Goldberg in the face with something. Scott Hudson... Ruins it. Absolutely ruins it. What a tool. The heels own Goldberg, including chair shots by Luger. Ric Flair made it no DQ, remember? So you can do that. The heels then finish with a great looking double blockbuster, and Goldberg is retired. I should have mentioned that before, shouldn't I? Goldberg's career was on the line in this one, and now he's retired. Yeah, and who cares? Um, the crowd are absolutely stunned, so I suppose this one worked, you know, on one level, but. Literally, the only move that I liked in this whole match was that fall away pump handle slam. That was beautiful. It literally gets him in the pump handle slam position. Then fall away. Oh, it's gorgeous. Quarter of a star for that move. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got one left. And it is the main event. So, Scott Steiner defeating Jeff Jarrett, Sid, and the mystery opponent 
to retain the WCW title. Ric Flair's mystery man isn't in, isn't here yet. Yay! I'm watching this on my Xbox, yeah? And I noticed, yeah, I bring up my time thing. I'm like, oh, I wonder how long this match is going to go. I noticed that before the bell's gone, this one, this show has got nine minutes left to run. So, like, well, this main event's going to be short. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure every single one of you out there who who's watching this vid now, if you've never seen any WCW yet, I'm sure you've seen this match. At least some of this match, if just for one little moment. Because this, this is the match where Sid goes up top, jumps off, and breaks his leg as he lands. He had been told by WCW management, we want you to improve your moveset a bit, you know, make your moveset bigger. Sid, being the guy he is, said, well, yeah, I'm a big guy. There's no point in me doing high-flying stuff. But, you know, he thought, you know, I'm being told what to do, so I will do it, you know, to his credit. And look what happened. <laughs> so, oh, dear me. Brawling leads to a side walk by Sid. Brawling leads to a belly-to-belly -belly by Steiner for two. Brawling! Then Jeff Jarrett and Steiner double team Sid with shit brawling on the outside, including Steiner using the belt. No disqualification, obviously, it's WCW. Uh, no, to be fair, Jeff Jarrett was distracting the referee. <laughs> Back inside, more awful brawling. Sid um, punch. Oh, Sid's punches, man. They're worse than Cena's. They're so bad. Really terrible. Sid reverses a double suplex attempt, right? Yeah, imagine yeah, they're, they're doing a double suplex in, yeah? He counters it into one of his own, and literally, it looks like he br almost brain busters Jeff Jerry. Nasty looking stuff. Big boots and a choke slam on Jeff Jerry get two, a Cobra Cup slam for Steiner as Flair gets the Mystery Man, but it looks like Sid has broken his leg. The spot is hard to watch, even today. I've seen it a hundred times, but it's still like, damn, yeah, they're missing you. Basically, you know. We see Flair going and getting the Mystery Man. The Mystery Man, you've got, I've got to just point this out. His get-up is absolutely superb. He's wearing what looks like a, a, a big jumper, yeah, that's meant to look like it's a straight jacket. It's got all things all over it. And he's wearing not one, but two masks on his face, yeah? It's so like, right, uh, yeah, really, you've got no idea who it is. Yeah, he comes out, basically, you see Flair going and get him and saying, you know, showtime, the guy gets out of the limo. And, of course, all the guys in the ring have got to stall for time while waiting for the music cue. So, basically, you know, it's obvious that there's something seriously wrong with Sid. He's on the ground. His leg is pointing in two directions. You're like, holy fuck, you know, Steiner obviously is stalled. We know I do it. Jeff Jarrett's gone, by the way. So Steiner has to keep going over and just booting Sid in the head. Flair's music hits. Mystery Man comes out. Who is you? Know, and he basically, oh man, he kicks, he kicks Sid in the head, and then Steiner pins Sid. And that, so you're just like, so what the fuck was the point in that? Mystery Man takes his mask off. Takes his second mask off. And who is it? Is it Stone Cold? Is it The Rock? Is it Triple H? Who could it be? It's Road Warrior Animal. And you're just like, oh, I don't care about him. Damn it. The heels celebrate, all three of them, on a turnbook. And even Jeff Jerick sat there with his guitar, you know, in the air, like, yay, I lost. <laughs> I don't know why Jeff's there, but he is. Um, while, of course, Sid is tended to by EMTs, he had broken both the le most, both the moments in his leg, his tibia, tibia and his fibula, both of them, and two, you know, two, as, as far as the mainstream wrestling is concerned, he never wrestled again. He's wrestled like two or three times since then, and this was ten years ago. What to say about, you know, what do we say about that? First things first, ladies and gentlemen, you'll be proud to notice. Oh, I'm going to my notes then. You were proud to notice that that was the first match of the show that was a dud. There was nothing to note on this show at all. On this match, sorry. But this one, this one's a, this show is a hard one to rate because, 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 because the, 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 the first half is either really good or like better than it should be. The last three matches are utter, utter drivel. You know, like one move saving two of those matches. You know, they're both quarter of the starts and they're a dud main event. You know? Yeah, it's like it's like it's like if the company just focused on what you saw on the undercard, you know, it, yeah, it would be make you more money. But yeah, that main event, who wanted to see that? There's a reason why its buy rate was so low. Genuinely tough one to call, but I'm gonna go with a five out of ten. Mildly recommended, it's a thumbs firmly in the middle. Oh yes, ladies and gentlemen, join me again for another episode of 10 Years Ago where we're going to be looking at WWF No Way Out 2001. I've been Mark P. I really hope you've enjoyed this vid. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. Let me know what you think of the fucking show. 
down here. I know it's been a lot of waffle. I can feel my fucking my mouth's gone dry again. <laughs> but hey, that's my style, and I like it like that. I'll be my, I, 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 I will be Mark P. I was gonna say that. I will be back soon. I've been Mark P. Take it. Look at the time. Ten past six in the morning. <laughs> you know, I've got an excuse. <laughs> Take it easy, guys.